Good evening. The, if not the oldest, then one of the oldest professions in the world is that of matchmaker. And this business continu continues until today because in the world the most marriages are still arranged marriages. Traditionally, some friendly old lady will advise the family or both families about the best match for their son or daughter. The two youngsters will then meet and get married, whether they like it or not, and then the wait for offspring can begin. Nowadays, the traditional matchmaking ladies have been replaced with an algorithm. On countless websites and apps, the families can look for themselves and try to find a, candidate, a suited candidate for their children. Here in the West, we also use apps to find a partner, but here we like to decide for ourselves, or so we think, whether this or another candidate is suited as a partner for the longer or the shorter term. Matchmaking is also big now on television and on uh, streaming media platforms. To find your soulmate, the love of your life, the perfect match, is the goal of so-called romantic reality shows. In these shows, the candidates are brought to some beautiful island in the sun, and there they sit on the palm trees, sip on, their, sip on colorful drinks, and hang out with young, handsome people like themselves. In the bikini shows, like uh, Ex on the Beach and Temptation Island, uh, young men and women in swimsuits partner up for a night or maybe a couple of days. On Love Island, the participants are expected to find their partner for life. In Married at First Sight, the participants are matched by a uh, panel of matchmaking experts. The goal there is to find out whether those experts are right or wrong, so to stay married or get divorced. Those TV experts, the algorithm makers and the old ladies all seem to think that the perfect match exists. Is this true? And what would constitute this perfect match? The obvious hypothesis would be that um, a perfect match is made if the matched couple falls in love. Um, love is proof for the ultimate match. We are all conditioned to have this view because we've all seen Love Actually or Silver Linings Playbook or some other romantic comedy in which um, uh, the perfect match is, is, is made as such. Um, or we have seen some romantic reality show in which the perfect match uh, is proven if, the, uh, if two of the candidates make out. But this, is this true for, for real life? Is finding your perfect match the same as having sex with somebody you just met? Maybe not. Is establishing the perfect match then the same as um, finding true love? Is love proof indeed for the perfect match? As a couples therapist, I have seen a lot of imperfect matches. Uh, my clients tell me they feel alienated from their partners. Um, after 10 or 20 years, they say um, that the gap between them and their partners can no longer be bridged. They have too many different opinions, the families are not alike, they do not hold the same values as their partners, or their personalities are incompatible. But when I ask those people, how did your relationship begin, they tell me, um, it was all moonlight and roses and violins when I first met my better half. They tell me about the burning love and the blissful, uh, uh, the blissful uh, intimacy and the great sex life they once had. With a smile on their face, they remember how they couldn't live for even a minute without their loved one by their sides. So what happened? What explains the big difference between the beginning and the supposed endings of the relationships? Wasn't true love true after all? Or was their match imperfect from the beginning? After speaking to hundreds of couples in the past 25 years, I learned that people love each other in the beginning of a relationship, but they also love each other in the end. Relationships do not end because um, uh, love ends. Relationships and love are two different things. Of course, you need love uh, to sustain a longer relationship, but other factors are also at play. So what are those factors? Key to a good relationship is intimacy. That is no secret. We all know that um, in order to uh, keep a relationship going, you need to be intimate at the beginning of your relationship. I would argue that all the other ingredients of a good relationship, 
such as uh, commitment or um, the ability to function as a team, and most importantly, the ability to remain autonomous and connected to your loved one at the same time, all begin with intimacy. And with intimacy, I mean physical intimacy or sex, but also cognitive intimacy, the feeling that you can share your whole life with your partner. At the beginning of our relationship, you need to open up completely. You need to share all your opinions, your ideas, your hopes and dreams with your partner. And for that kind of intimacy, you need trust. So how do you begin to trust a complete stranger? How do you, what do you need to allow somebody you just met to come really, really close? To gain trust like that, you need some reassurance. And that's why all the singles of this world make such long lists of specifications that their future partners have to meet. And I've seen many of those lists because I was a matchmaker at the panel of Married at First Sight. And at the beginning of uh, the matchmaking process in this show, uh, all the candidates would give me their list of specifications. I sometimes felt like a chef who was ordered to prepare a five-star dinner using only lemons and biscuits and salt. <laughs> and the list the candidates gave me were all very similar. They all wanted to meet somebody who was homely but also adventurous. Very sweet but also macho. <laughs> This person would have to be uh, great with children but also a tiger in the sheets. <laughs> Modest and ambitious. An intellectual and a sportsman. You get the picture. No wonder we had to disappoint our candidates. They expected too much from their future brides and grooms. Um, but, but more importantly, those characteristics, those lists of specifications, um, those characteristics were not the factors that inspire trust. Because if you uh, admire a sportsman, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to become intimate with this person. Or if you admire ambition in, in a woman, You do, not, you do not immediately trust her. In the course of my three seasons as a matchmaker, I learned that only three factors really matter when it comes to matchmaking. Geography, mental stability, and resources. Why geography? If people live more than half an hour away from each other, they find it really hard to trust one another. It's not the driving or the traffic per se that bothers them. It's, it's the familiarity. If the other person has the same accent, has gone to the same schools and supports the same soccer clubs, the chances for a perfect match are substantially higher. If the other person talks funny, though, or probably doesn't know anybody we know, we swipe left. Why mental stability? It's really hard to trust a person uh, who behaves very differently on Wednesdays than on Tuesdays and Mondays. There is safety in reliability. If you feel that you can lend someone a great sum of money and get it back, you're much more likely to engage this person in a business or a friendship and in a love relationship. And speaking about money, the third factor in matchmaking is the most important one. We will only get involved if um, our partner, our future partner, has resources. Our prospective partners need to have money or power or a network that will become available to us. We trust people much sooner if they own some land or camels or bitcoins or if they're famous <laughs> or if they have some political pool in the community. In short, the best matches we made in Merit at First Sight were between neighbors who knew how to dress correctly and who both owned a decent car. Those were the people that were most likely to start trusting each other, allowing for intimacy to occur, the foundation of every love relationship. Now, I was not the only or the first matchmaker to stumble upon the best ingredients for um, a good match. The old matchmaking ladies have always known that they have to count the cows of both families in order to make a good match. And modern research has shown the same. It has shown that uh, geography, mental stability and resources are crucial matchmaking factors. By the way, psychologists also found that it doesn't really matter uh, whether a couple was matched by experts or whether they have found each other themselves. We, the free people of the West, also, use, of also look for a stable neighbor with a bank account if we uh, contemplate marriage or a longer relationship. Um, where am I now? <laughs> um, let me see. Um,
Uh, let me check my notes for one second. <coughs> I thought I knew it all, but I didn't. Ah, yeah. I was going to say that this insight into uh, the mechanics of relationship formation is not very romantic, is it? Um, what about love? Where did love go while I was discussing the, about the practicalities of matchmaking? What about the, the, the romantic feeling, the butterflies in our stomach? What about love that turns our lives upside down and makes us feel, uh, and turns our, uh, makes us feel so very and much alive? In a relationship, we need um, intimacy and we need trust, but we also need the fairy tale of love. We want to tell a good story about our love. We want to tell our special story. Love is a feeling, but love is also a narrative. After working as a matchmaker for Married at First Sight. I was asked to screen and consult candidates for shows like Ex on the Beach, Temptation Island and Love Island. And this meant that I would travel with them to those beautiful islands. And there I would talk to them as a so-called psych on set um, during the recording periods. And this experience taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about the fairy tale quality of love. It taught me that maybe you cannot hurry love, but you can surely try to make things easier for love to emerge. Key is a good love story. Why do so many people watch romantic reality shows? Because we all love a good romantic fairy tale. And we know this fairy tale by heart because we've seen it and heard it uh, a thousand times in just about every movie or play or book or uh, podcast that we've ever enjoyed. The basic story goes like this. Boy meets girl or girl meets girl or boy meets boy. And the chemistry miraculously draws them together. But then a problem occurs, um, the families don't agree, war breaks out, or one of them has attachment issues that stand in the way. So now they both have to change. They have to become braver, or they have to learn something about themselves before they fall into each other's arms again and live happily ever after. Now every reality show follows this narrative arc. And reality shows are not scripted, the participants are not actors, that's why they're called reality shows, right? But reality is really boring to look at. I'm sorry, but it is. The public wants something more. The public wants a good story to identify with. A story that goes beyond, we met on the beach, made out, and moved in together. And every editor knows this. Every good editor will give the public what it wants. So a good editor will turn the footage into the old romantic narrative. So. Yes, reality television is real, just like love actually is real. When we see reality, we don't buy it. But when we see a good story, we think it's real. And the strangest thing of all is, and I've witnessed this happening many times, is that the participants in reality shows really do fall in love. It's like the love story is too compelling even for them. Um, they're on this beautiful island with this beautiful person surrounded by luxury it would be hard for them not to fall in love, right? So we fall in love with the person we are intimate with, a person we can trust. And for this trust to emerge, we need to believe that this person has resources, is mentally stable, and lives around the corner. But we also need some fairy tale magic. We need a good story that makes us believe in love. And for that, we need a little bit of luck and a damn good editor. Thank you.